Jim Candy, Part 5, Chapter 9. Game 7 was against Liberty High, way out in Issaquah. They were good, but not great. The kind of team that could beat us only if we turned the ball over or committed a ton of penalties. All week long, I told myself I could play the game straight, that I didn't need anything. But on game day, I made sure that Kit was in the bottom of my duffel. Carlson had gotten a bus. On the ride out, I again held tight on my, to my duffel, trying not to look as though I was holding on tight. Every once in a while, I'd glance at Drew and wonder if he suspected. Then I'd look at Steins and think the same thing. Finally, I realized how stupid I was being. They weren't thinking about me. They were thinking about the game. The Liberty locker room was like every other one, dark, damp, and smelly. I sat down on one of the benches and got into my gear. Then I picked up my duffel and made my way to the bathroom, again choosing the stall farthest from the lockers. I thought I'd be less nervous, but my hands still shook. When I finished with the injection, I wrapped everything up in the towel, put it into the duffel, opened the stall door, stepped out, and looked back toward the locker room. That's when I saw Drew. He was standing just inside the restroom door, about 30 feet away. For a moment, we stared at each other, silent. Let's crush these guys, he finally said. I slung the duffel over my shoulder. Okay, by me, I answered, and I headed out to the locker room, my chest tight. A couple minutes later, we huddled as a team at the mouth of the tunnel leading to the field. Around me, guys were starting to scream and bounce up and down. The noise spread like a disease, and adrenaline, steroid, amphetamine craziness came over me. And pretty soon, I was screaming and bouncing up and down more than anyone. The next thing I knew, I was running out into the field, then doing jumping jacks and push-ups, and a few minutes later, the game was on. You play a team at their field, and it always takes time to get comfortable. I don't know why a football field is a football field. We bumbled our way through the first quarter. I was too jumpy, too high, hitting the holes before the blocks had opened anything up. Drew turned the ball over on a fumbled snap, killing one drive, and another drive died when he tripped, dropping back to pass. Liberty had the ball near midfield at the start of the second quarter. I was standing along the sideline, wound tight as a wire, watching our defense, when I felt someone staring at me. I looked, and as I did, Drew looked away. I went over to the trainer and got myself some water and then glanced back at him. Now he wasn't looking at me at all, but was talking to Deshaun. They both laughed at something, and then Deshaun gave Drew a push, and Drew pushed him back. As I drank the water down, I told myself to stop imagining things. So now we have Mick being paranoid, and one of the reasons why he's being paranoid is because he went into the restroom stall to do the XTR, came out, and Drew was there. Right, and so of course someone's going to wonder why you're bringing an entire duffel bag into a restroom stall. So we, as this part um, five continues to go on, Drew is getting more and more curious and suspicious about uh, Mick and the fact that something might be going on there. And of course Mick thinks this and is becoming more and more paranoid about it. Our defense held and we are back on the field. We managed a couple of first downs before we had to punt. The whole game was stuck. Neither team could do anything. Right before halftime, the Liberty kicker punched through a 32-yard field goal. The ball actually hit the goalpost, but it flopped through on the opposite side, and those three points were the only points of the half. During halftime, Carlson fumed. You thought you were going to walk in here with your undefeated record and they were going to roll over for you, but they're not. I don't like losing when the other team is better, but I hate losing to a team that isn't as good. There's only one reason they're ahead. They want it more than you. And they're going to beat you unless you turn it around. Now go out there and play some football. For the rest of the break, the guys stretched out on the benches resting. But I was too keyed up to do that. I kept pacing back and forth. Sit down, Mick, Middleton said. You're making me tired. I broke a few tackles on my first run of the second half, and then a few more tackles on the next run. And I could tell the Liberty defenders were back on their heels. We had the ball, second and four at their 38. I took Drew's hand off and worked my way toward the sideline, forcing them to pursue laterally. Drizzen made a great block on their middle linebacker, and I cut upfield behind it. I had a full head of steam going as I broke into the secondary. A safety came up to try and tackle me, but I lowered my shoulder, sent him sprawling, and staggered toward the goal line before tumbling into the end zone for the first touchdown of the game. Shills hole 7, Liberty 3. Liberty took the kickoff, but a holding penalty pushed them back into the shadow of their goalposts. Because of their terrible field position, they ran three straight running plays, and a bad punt gave us great field position. On first down, Carlson called the same stretch play again. I broke into the secondary, and there was the same safety coming up on me again. I'd embarrassed the guy the time before. He was a football player. He wanted to get revenge by laying a big hit on me, so I used that against him. 
Instead of taking him on, I juked left, took one step right, and then went left. He crossed his feet trying to stay with my move and then tripped and fell. I was by him like a flash. Shills hole 14, Liberty 3. I thought we'd broke them. I thought our defense would hold them and that I'd be back on the field in minutes. I could hardly wait to get out there and crack that defense again. Crack it the way you crack an egg against a pan. But Liberty didn't quit. They slogged to a couple of first downs, and then on a third and four near midfield, they burned us with a trick play. It looked like their stock running play, a pitch out to their halfback sweeping right. The play developed slowly, too slowly. As our cornerback came up to tackle him, the halfback dropped back into a passing position, and there was Liberty's quarterback streaking down the left side of the field, totally uncovered. The halfback's pass was a wobbly spiral, but it led the quarterback perfectly. He caught the ball in stride and then raced down the sideline for their first touchdown. Liberty went for two on the conversion, helping to pull within a field goal, but their fullback was stopped short. Shills hole 14, Liberty 9. The Liberty crowd went crazy and the players were pumped up, smelling the upset victory over their undefeated, ranked team. And they had the momentum back, no doubt about it. Still, there were only five minutes left in the game. If we could run out the clock, we'd have it. A win against a good team on the road. Carlson put the game on my shoulders. I was still strong, still feeling jacked up, while everyone else was slowing. On first down, I took the ball for eight yards right up the middle, and then went off tackle for seven and a first down on the next play. Four minutes and change left in the game. The next play was a quick pitch. I'd been cutting back all game long. This time I went for the corner, never even looking for a lane. I got it too, and I was in the open field with nothing but green grass ahead of me. 50, 40, 30, 20, 15, 10. That's when I eased up. And that's when their safety, the guy I'd beaten twice, reached in from behind and poked the ball free. It skittered into the end zone, and before I realized what was happening, he flopped on it. In seconds, I'd gone from hero to goat. I'd fumbled away the ball, and perhaps the game, and the season along with it. The Liberty safety stood up, the football tucked under his arm, and smirked at me. A black rage came over me, the same black rage I'd felt when Deshaun had brought the penalty flag fluttering in. But the Liberty safety wasn't 90 yards away. The Liberty guy wasn't 10 seconds away. There was no time for me to think, to gather control, to pull back. He was right there. The rage took over. I knew the play was dead, that it was touchback, that he couldn't run the ball out of the end zone. I knew those things, but I leveled him anyway. Stuck my helmet into his ribs and drove him into the turf, wiping that smirk off his face. He lay on the ground, rolling this way and that, writhing in pain. Yellow penalty flags flew all around me. Personal foul, 15 yards. I knew that was coming. But then the ref pointed at me and pointed to the tunnel. I'd been ejected. I thought he could run, I screamed. I thought he could run. The ref turned and walked away. I started after him, but Deshaun in intercepted me. A second later, Carlson had me by the elbow. Go to the locker room, Mick, he said. Now. A chorus of boos cascaded down from the stands. I looked back to the field. The trainer from Liberty was out on the field. The player I'd hit was still down, still rolling in pain. In that instant, I knew that what I'd done was out of line, crazy and dangerous, and I was ashamed. So here Mick takes out his frustration, and it's his own fault, right? He, he should have kept running hard into the end zone. Instead, he lets up. He lets that safety catch him, right, and get the ball out of his hands. So it's no one's fault but his own, but he takes it out on the first guy that he sees, which is that safety, right, and just completely lays into him. And after the rage has passed, right, I mean, he realizes that what he did was wrong. He says it in that part I just read. He says, in that instant, I knew that what I'd done was out of line, crazy and dangerous, and I was ashamed. It's like he realizes that he is acting out of control, but he can't stop it. As I walked down the tunnel leading to the locker room, the Liberty fans were up screaming at me, calling me a cheap shot artist and a thug. Somebody threw a Coke in my face. Once in the locker room, I went straight to a sink, turned on the cold water, and splashed it on my face. What had happened to me? The rage had come so fast and with such fury that I'd been powerless. It had come like a meteor falling from the sky. No, not like a meteor, like a bomb. I'd been in the locker room about five minutes when Mr. Stimes came in. I was sure he was going to tell me that Liberty had marched down the field and scored, sure that we'd lost because of my idiotic penalty. But Stimes gave me the thumb up. thumbs up. We won, he said. That's good, I answered. Is the guy I hit okay? Stimes shrugged. I'm sure he's felt better, but he walked off on his own power. He paused. Coach doesn't want you in the locker room when the team gets here, so grab your stuff and get onto the bus. I sat alone on the bus for half an hour before the team boarded. 
I took a window seat up front and stared into the street as the guys filed past me. The bus ride back took 40 minutes, but it seemed like 40 hours. I was certain Carlson would come chew me out. I wanted him to come chew me out, but he never even looked at me. When the bus pulled into the school parking lot, I grabbed my duffel and was the first player off. My Jeep was parked towards the tennis courts. I had it started and was out of the parking lot before 10 guys were off the bus. My dad had been at the game, right on the 50, his usual spot. I was sure he'd be sitting at the kitchen table. I thought about driving around for a couple of hours to wait him out. But what, what would have been the point? I parked in the driveway next to his truck. When I opened the front door, I saw the light in the kitchen. I went in. His eyes were bright with anger. What was that all about, Mick? He said. Have you lost your mind? Does mom know? He shook his head. No, I told her you had a good game, which was true, by the way, until you trashed it. Will it be in the newspaper tomorrow? I doubt it. Writers go easy on high school kids. But if you pull something like that in college, it'll be on Sports Center. The whole country will see it. For a while, neither of us spoke. Then he waved his hand, dismissing me. Go to bed. There's nothing to be said. Mick knows what he did was wrong. You know, he bolts off the bus as soon as they get back to Shoals Hole High, gets in his Jeep, drives home, knows his dad's going to be there. And his dad's the one, you know, always pushing him hard, you know, really intense about football. And yet, even his dad says, you know, what you did was wrong and can mess up your future.